Good morning. Welcome to the fifth meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee. Uh, can I ask everyone to make sure that their mobile devices are switched off or on silent? Item number one is a decision to take business uh, in private. Um, can the committee please uh, decide whether to take items five, six and seven in private? Thank you. The next item is an evidence session on the Auditor General's for Scotland's report audit of higher education in Scottish universities. And I welcome to the meeting this morning Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Anthony Clark, Assistant Director, Tricia Meldrum, Senior Manager, and Kirsty White, uh, Audit Manager for Audit Scotland. I invite the Auditor General to make her opening statement before I open up to questions from members. Thank you, convener. This report is our first look at the overall landscape of higher education in Scotland, and I'd like to take the opportunity to outline the context that Scottish higher education operates in, as it is a bit different to the other sectors we audit. As you know, the Scottish higher education sector is successful and internationally renowned. Higher education is a devolved area, except for funding and policy relating to UK research councils and Innovate UK, the UK's innovation agency. Other aspects of UK government policy do affect the higher education sector in Scotland, such as UK immigration policy and English higher education policy. Scottish universities generate funding from a wide range of sources, both public and private. So while universities are independent, they operate within an environment of multiple stakeholders, regulators and accountabilities. I don't appoint their auditors, unlike the other bodies on which I report to you here in Parliament. Um, but since 2010, I've had formal powers to undertake performance audits of bodies funded by the Scottish Funding Council, and that's the basis of this report. In 2014-15, the Scottish Government provided £1.1 billion in funding for universities through the Scottish Funding Council and £623 million in fees, grants and loans for individual students. Scotland's economic strategy is clear about the contribution that higher education makes in supporting Scotland's economy. But we think the, S the Scottish Funding Council needs to do more to make sure the funding it allocates to universities makes the maximum contribution to those national policy aims. Overall, the sector was in good financial health in 2014-15. Its total income was £3.5 billion, up 38% in real terms over the last decade. The sector made a surplus of £146 million in 2014-15, and it had reserves of £2.5 billion, all large sums, as you'll recognise. Universities increasingly use their surpluses and reserves to fund investments in their estate and to subsidise some of their activities, particularly research. Despite the overall positive picture, though, there is wide variation across the sector and a number of underlying risks. Income is increasingly concentrated in the ancient universities. Some universities rely heavily on funding council funding, and that creates risks at a time of continued pressure on public finances. The surpluses and reserves that I mentioned are heavily concentrated in a few universities, particularly Edinburgh and Glasgow. And of course, the EU referendum result has increased uncertainty for the sector, with the possible impact on the public finances generally, adding to risk to EU funding for Scottish universities and the effect on EU students and staff. The challenges facing the sector include potential further reductions in Scottish Government funding, risk to their ability to continue increasing their income from fee-paying students from the rest of the UK and from out with the EU, the need to invest in their estate, and challenging new targets on widening access. Turning from universities to students, I want to highlight just two points. First, it has become more difficult in recent years for Scottish undergraduate students to gain a place at a Scottish university. This is mainly because applications from Scottish students have risen faster than the number of funded places available for them. Since 2010, applications have increased by 23%, while offers increased by 9%. We've recommended that the Scottish Government and the Funding Council should carry out research to assess what impact the limits on funded places have on access for Scottish students. Secondly, recent changes to student financial support increased the amount of loan funding available to all Scottish students, while the amount of funding for bursaries and grants fell. As a result, levels of student debt are increasing. Scottish students from more deprived areas continue to have higher levels of debt than students from less deprived areas, and the gap is widening. 
As I've highlighted, universities, the Funding Council and the government are facing a number of significant challenges to this very successful sector, and we've recommended that they need to work together to address them. It's essential that the government does ensure its approach to funding higher education is sustainable in the medium to longer term if its policy priorities are to be delivered. Convener, my colleagues and I are, as always, happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Auditor General. Can I invite questions from members? Monica Lennon. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Auditor General. On page 46, you identify that Scottish students from deprived areas have higher levels of student loan debt than students from less deprived areas, and you've said so in your um, opening statement. Is the cost associated with going to university and the prospect of debt presenting a barrier to school leavers from deprived areas? Um, the, the straightforward answer, I think, is that at the moment we simply don't know. It's why we've recommended um, that the government and the funding council should be carrying out more um, research on the impact of the current approach to funding higher education um, to understand the uh, effect of current policy decisions and of the future. I'll ask Tricia to talk you through that in a bit more detail, if I may. And we know there, there's a review of um, approaches to funding or funding student support is going on over the summer so or, or it's going over on over the next 12 months or so. So it's due to report early next year. So we'll see what, what the, the implications of that are. There's also obviously been the Commission on Widening Access report and a number of recommendations around access for opening up access to students from a wider range of backgrounds, more deprived backgrounds. Again, the first action there is going to be to appoint a commissioner for fair access and, and then to take forward that, that programme working with the Scottish Government, SFC, universities. And again, these will all be issues to, to look at through that programme of work. On the, the point um, about the Commissioner for Fair Access, um, I see in his response to the committee, Paul Johnston, the Director General of Learning and Justice, suggests that progress on implementing the recommendations of the Commission on Widening Access is contingent on the appointment of a Commissioner for Fair Access. Do you agree with that assessment, that it's contingent on this appointment? Um, I, I think that the appointment is obviously a very important symbol of the government's commitment to widening access um, and to taking forward the recommendations from the Commission. Um, it is only one of the recommendations that the Commission put forward. Um, there has been a delay so far in making the appointment. I think there was an announcement this week made about how it will be taken forward, uh, but it certainly isn't the only thing that's needed in order to um, answer the questions that we've set out here about both the number of places available for Scottish students and the effect of the student support system in Scotland on students from different backgrounds. Thank you. Just to go back to um, student debt, on page 44 of the report, you identify that Scottish student debt has increased in recent years with financial support shifting from non-repayable bursaries and grants to loans. Overall, we're seeing student debt levels rising 14% between 2013 and, and 2015 and are projected to average around £20,000 by 2019. What impact would you say this is having on student retention rates? Again, it's not well enough understood in terms of research. We can all speculate about what the effect is. I think one of the things that's concerning, though, is um, what we set out in Exhibit 18 on page 47, which is that it's students from the most deprived backgrounds who are um, ending up with the highest levels of debt. Mm -hmm. um, that exhibit shows levels of debt uh, according to the um, most deprived fifth all the way through to the least deprived fifth, and students from the most deprived backgrounds are ending up with more um, debt at the end of their studies. The more the increase, it, the more reliance there is on debt to fund um, studying, the more that picture is likely to become a problem, I think. It's why we've recommended the research to explore it further. Patricia. To add, um, in relation to information on retention rates, so some of the, the information we've got there is from 13-14, but that was showing overall 8% um, of students not staying beyond their first year so 92% so staying beyond their first year. But again, wide variation within universities there. And the highest um, number of students not staying beyond their first year in university of, um, sorry, being 20% in, being in University of Highlands and Islands. So quite, quite wide variation again there. OK, but it is quite an important uh, theme in the report, because on page 49, the report notes it will be difficult to achieve the national targets for widening access to higher education 
for students from deprived backgrounds and you're recommending that the Scottish Government, the Funding Council and the University need to all work together and you said that in your statement. Would more funding help to meet these widening access targets? Um, I think there's no doubt that, that more funding would help because it would um, help to keep the number of funded places increasing at a similar rate to the increase in applications, which seems to be the underlying cause of the, the growing gap we're seeing. Um, and we know that um, the pressure on public finances is real and continuing. Um, that's likely to happen, whatever we hear in the autumn statement um, in November and whatever the Scottish Government's draft budget looks like after that. Um, as always, there are choices <coughs> to be made here. Um, we are very conscious that um, the choices made about higher education sit within the government's wider programme for government, and there are always trade-offs there. That's what government's about. It's why we think it's so important to, to <coughs> properly understand the impact of the policy choices that have been made and to tease out any tensions or inconsistencies that there might be in there. Can I just pick up on funding, convener? Um, on page 20, I think paragraph 35, you said that the Scottish Funding Council allocated £1.1 billion to universities in 2014-15. That's a reduction of 6% in real terms since 2010-2011. So this reflects a reduction in funding received by the Funding Council from the Scottish Government. Do you feel that this level of funding is sustainable? It's, that's a question, I think, really for government rather than for us. We, we do recognise that there is pressure on the Scottish Government's budget overall. From next year, there will be significant choices to make about the use of the new financial powers, but they're not going to be a magic wand that will massively increase the amount available, available for public services across the piece. I think what we're concerned about in this particular area in higher education is that there are um, some ambitious policy commitments <coughs> around widening access um, and around the funding of students Student support, um, which will um, butt up against some of the, the cost pressures facing universities already around their difficulty in raising income from other sources, particularly tuition fees from students in the rest of the UK and outside Europe. Um, and it's really important that the government and the funding council, together with universities, understand how those pressures will face together. It may be something the committee decides to explore further with the funding council and the government, I think, to see how they're thinking about the way those different challenges will be balanced in future um, has been developed into the medium to long term. OK, just one final question. Keep it out. Um, on the 7th of September at the Education and Skills Committee, Professor Andrea Nolan from University of Scotland said that your report, um, and I'll quote uh, Professor Nolan, indicated quite clearly that the sector sustainability is not being addressed we need the funding for a sustainable sector that will recover the cost of our teaching and our research while recognising that we are in difficult times. Do you agree with Professor Nolan's assessment? Um, I, I think it's, it's, uh, uh, that's really the message of our report, that the sector is, as I said, internationally renowned, generally very successful, and it's facing some real pressures in relation to the funding available to it, the costs of continuing to deliver what it does, and the government's policy priorities. Now, we have identified some ways in which those um, tensions can be managed um, to do with universities continuing to uh, seek efficiencies, um, to invest in new ways of delivering both research and teaching, and to work together in doing some of that. But more generally, it is a question for the government and the funding council to work with universities to really understand how um, public funding, government funding, can have the biggest contribution to the things that government wants to achieve um, and support this sector, which is currently one of Scotland's strengths. Okay. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Just, just to pick up on a point that uh, Monica Lennon was making there about uh, the debt levels of students from deprived areas versus those from less deprived areas, would you not expect that students from deprived areas would have a higher level of debt simply because, firstly, they qualify more than the students from the less deprived areas to be able to access funding, and, uh, and uh, secondly, they, uh, they obviously have the need for it. 
I think intuitively that does make sense, and it's certainly a pattern that, um, you, that we see more widely than just in Scotland. I think um, the issue is uh, the question that Ms Lennon asked, which is, do we understand the impact on that of students applying to Scottish mm. universities and taking up places? And there isn't good enough information about that part of the mix. Um, in, in England, I think there's good evidence that actually higher levels of um, uh, loan funding for higher education actually isn't deterring students from applying. We simply don't know what the picture is in Scotland at the moment, and that would help to make good policy decisions. Is that something you're going to follow up in due course? We've recommended that the government and the funding council should be doing that, and, and we'll certainly be following up our recommendation with them once the committee's finished its deliberations on the report. Have your recommendations been accepted by the various parties? The committee has written to the Director General and the Chief Executive of the Funding Council, and I think you have the submissions before you today. Um, I think the government's um, response to that point um, is slightly ambiguous. It may be something you want to follow up with uh, the government um, after this session. Okay. Um, you've talked uh, about uh, research and development, and obviously there's concerns in various parts of the, the sector about that. Is this something you're going to be keeping an eye on and following up, because obviously it will only be in time to come that we'll understand what the impact is of Brexit. Yeah, I think our concern is that the um, Scottish Funding Council's strategy for research and for funding research in universities um, is somewhat out of date now. It hasn't been re reviews, re revised for a while, and it needs to be so in order for the Funding Council to be clear that its funding is having the effect that it needs to. And we know there are some challenges with um, the research funding that's available from other sources not covering the full costs of research. Um, I'll ask Kirsty to talk you through that issue, if I may. Here we go. In terms of, in terms of research and the, the funding approach of the Funding Council, we know that they're starting to review their approach to research at the moment. One of the issues we identify in the report is that the performance of Scottish universities in terms of research is improving. It's improved between 2008 and 2014, the annual exercises that assess how well universities do research, if you will. However, at the same time, the research funding hasn't got any bigger. Um, so what that means is the research budget has been spread more thinly and some of the very high-performing research universities actually saw a reduction in their research funding um, after the 2014 exercise. So, as we see in the report, it raises issues around sustainability. As the Auditor General mentioned, research is traditionally an activity in universities that doesn't cover its cost. It recovered just around, universities recovered just around 80% of full economic cost last year. That differs depending on the source. Some universities who win a lot of charity funding are only recovering around 65% of the full economic cost of those activities up to just over 80% for the UK Research Council funding. So, as the Auditor-General said, it, is, it just places an additional pressure on universities and raises issues around sustainability. Another point that seems to come up all the way through the report uh, is reference to SFC and the issues about uh, the way it handles funding and various other things. Is there, a, is, there, is there a problem here with how the SFC is handling this? We've said in this report and in the one um, which appears a bit later on your agenda in relation to further education that um, the role of the Funding Council has changed very significantly over the last few years with major reforms in both sectors to the way funding is allocated and, and to the responsibilities the Funding Council carries out. But its role hasn't been reviewed for at least 10 years. We've made a recommendation in the light of that and in some of the um, problems, particularly in further education, that this committee has looked at that the government should should look again at the role of the Funding Council, make sure that it's clear and that it's properly equipped to carry it out. Um, and that's being taken forward as part of the current review of the skills and enterprise agencies by the government at the moment. Okay. Um, one thing which, which comes out in the report, well, not really come out, it comes out in the report, doesn't come out in very great detail, is the commercial operations of the universities, which are fairly extensive and fairly lucrative. Uh, there's no, nothing in great depth have you looked at it um, to any great degree? There is an exhibit in the report which one of the team will point me to in just a moment. Um, yes, exhibit nine on page 32. 
um, which no, that's not the one I'm talking about. Apologies. Um, which shows the sources of income for uh, different universities. And you're right, they do very hugely. It's Exhibit 11 on page 34, which shows the income profile. Um, and you'll see um, that across the 19 institutions that we've looked at, um, some of them at the bottom of the exhibit have a very heavy reliance on um, Scottish Funding Council grants, more than 80% in the case of um, the University of the Highlands and Islands, right down to less than 20% for the University of St Andrews. And the other income which they receive is made up from a range of different sources. The um, extent to which they are reliant on public funding um, obviously places them at greater risk at a time when public funding is under pressure, as it is across the UK at the moment in Scotland in relation to um, funding council grants and tuition fees and from the UK research councils in relation to research funding. Um, we haven't looked directly at their success in generating um, commercial income directly, um, but it is very clear that they have um, had very, very differing levels of success and differing approaches um, to generating income out with what they get from the funding council and in student support. Um, again, that, that um, highlights our concern that um, although the sector as a whole is in reasonable financial health, some universities are much more at risk than others in the current climate. Given, given, looking at Exhibit 11 here, given the, the value of the commercial element to the universities, would there be merit in uh, a closer look at this? Um, there, there certainly would. I think the universities themselves play, pay a great deal of attention to it, um, and they have different um, assets, different sources of expertise, different capacities to generate commercial income. It's one of the reasons why we've recommended the Funding Council should take a closer and more transparent interest in the financial health of individual institutions. Um, we think that's not well enough understood outside the universities um, and is something that could lead either to better funding strategies by the Funding Council or to um, a, a better identification of opportunities for collaboration, for example, between universities or with other parts of the public sector and with business. Does the success or otherwise in the commercial sector of the universities compare well with uh, universities south of the border or elsewhere? I think it depends very much which universities you're talking about. Kirsty might be able to give you some insight into that. You don't need to press the button. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. Um, it's not something we looked at in a lot of detail. It is, however, an agenda that both Scotland and universities in the rest of the UK, particularly England, are focusing on in terms of the innovation agenda, the, the further commercialisation of research activities, spin-off um, companies. We know that Scotland overall is actually quite successful in terms of the higher education sector, in terms of spin-offs per head, if you will, compared to the rest of the UK. Um, but as I say, it's, it's something that I, I think the Funding Council, the government and universities are working on and, and certainly could look at further. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Um, just to follow up on that point before I get into what I was wanting to ask, do, do, are you aware of any studies? It seems to me the, the sector delivers a much wider benefit to the, the economy uh, than simply producing students graduating. Uh, would you care to talk about uh, what is or what appears to be the return on investment wider than just putting through students through university? Yes, on page 11 of the report, we reference um, a study that was commissioned by University of Scotland from uh, an economics consultancy, Bigger Economics, and they estimated um, that the contribution was around £7.2 billion, pounds, um, which is obviously quite a favourable return on investment um, compared to the um, two, £2 billion or so, £1.1 1 .1 billion plus £600 million, million, which is direct Scottish government um, investment in the universities. Now, clearly, there's always some judgment about that, but I think it gives you a feel for the economic benefits um, and all of us who live in university cities will recognise the, the wider um, benefits that come from uh, the liveliness and the openness that they bring with them. Mm -hmm. uh, so moving on then, the, uh, first of all may I say I enjoyed the reports, I thought they were very good as usual. I, I also took from it the, the environment that the sector is operating in is clearly very challenging, uh, but they continue to produce extraordinary results. And I think that is to be 
acknowledged and commended. Uh, but can you draw any conclusion on the outcomes, uh, the long-term scenario, if I can put it that way, if nothing changes in relation to the funding? Because obviously what we see is in response to the challenges, the various institutions might sell some of the estate, they might seek uh, fee-paying students, they might use the reserves you mentioned, uh, but that's not sustainable, or I wouldn't have thought that is sustainable for any length of time. At some point you've sold all the estate that you can possibly do. So what's the outcome if nothing changes? I, I'll ask Anthony to come in in a moment. I, I think our concern is that um, within the 19 institutions we've got here, there are very different groupings. So the four ancient universities, um, for a whole range of reasons, are more successful in bringing in a wider range of funding. They tend to be the places where the surpluses are built up and the reserves, therefore, are available for investment. Um, and they're um, more likely to be able to get into that virtuous spiral of being able to invest and to build their success from there. The universities that are much more reliant on government funding, particularly at a time when that funding is constrained right across the government's budget, um, tend to be the ones that have fewer opportunities for generating income from other sources um, and therefore run the risk of the vicious circle that you were um, highlighting in your question. Um, now, that's not by any means a foregone conclusion. It, it is what the risks are unless um, the government and the funding council together with the universities are able to understand the, the interplay between the various priorities that they have and to make sure that the public funding that goes in is achieving the maximum contribution both to the government's policy aims and to the sustainability of individual institutions. Anthony, do you want to comment? Yes, I mean, I think the report highlights the fact that when we talk about this as a sector, in a way, it isn't a sector. You know, there are a range of different institutions serving different audiences with different markets, providing different services that deliver different outcomes. So whilst we think of universities as being higher education, they do do different things for, for different people. The report highlights a, a series of risks that face the sector collectively, but I think it's very clear that the institutions need to think through what market they want to be in, how they might grow or retrench in the face of the challenges that, that are facing them in terms of both Brexit and the, and the financial pressures facing the public sector. We're very aware from our field work that institutions are quite alert to this. You know, they have business planning processes in place. They have the oversight boards through the principals and the, the boards. Um, but there is a role, I think, nationally to have an overview of how the collectively the institutions work together to support the, the kind of economic goals and the broader learning outcomes that are set out in the Scottish Government strategy. Do you get any sense that <coughs> if, if, if one has a, a university that seeks to commercialise itself further by bringing in fee-paying students, do you get any sense that there's an issue with they will presumably then have to provide courses that attract those fee-paying students to the detriment of courses which do not? I don't think it's possible for me to answer that question, but it's quite clear that institutions that have a good reputation, both within the UK and internationally, are likely to draw in fee-paying students, and they clearly want to position themselves as, as bodies that have particular skills. Um, so I'm, 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 I think there is probably something in what you're saying, but I'm, I'm not sure the evidence that we've gathered could confirm that one way or the other. Sure. Uh, final thought. It was just on, uh, Tricia, you talked about this uh, research and report that's going on about the uh, Scottish students. Because uh, I have a concern, or rather I have had concerns raised to me frequently that very good Scottish students are unable to get a place at universities in Scotland uh, because the cap has been hit. Uh, do you have any comment to make on that or anything that you have you found anything about that? Um, yeah, so, so we lay out some of the, the information and the data around this in the report. So what we found, as the Auditor General said in her, her opening remarks, was the number of applications from students has been increasing at a faster rate than the number of places that are funded. And when, when we've worked that through, um, so we've managed to identify the number of people who don't get a place at all through that process. So we set that out in, in paragraph 95 on page 41 of the report. So um, for, the, for the last year where there is information available, we know that um, almost 9,000 or applicants, potential students, didn't receive any offers at all. And that's about one in five of the people 
the people who applied. And there isn't any information available about what subsequently happened to those people. So we don't know if they then got a place at college or they, they went and they worked for a while and then subsequently reapplied and, and went to university down that route. So again, so we've made recommendations about more research to actually to understand what's happening and what impact the, the, the limits on the number of funded places are happening on on applicants and different groups of applicants and applicants from different backgrounds. Thank you. Okay. Alex Neil. Okay. Uh, I'm happy if you were, uh, It's almost kind of following on from what uh, Liam said. If you get this differential between the increase in places and the increase in uh, applications, what would be the order of magnitude of the additional cost of bringing the increase in the number of available places up to the same growth level as the increase in the number of applications? It's a difficult question to answer. I think the Commission on Widening Access looked at this um, and they made some estimates about that figure, but they also made some other recommendations about, about how you could balance demand with the funding that's available, um, looking at things like um, making the um, uh, Scottish degree shorter so that the cost is um, less uh, in, in comparison, so getting more student funding from the same amount of funding, um, making articulation more straightforward so that students could do some of their studying and further education and then carry on into higher education. I think it's a question for government and the funding council to think through both the impact of the number of funded places and the related question of widening access to enable more students from the more deprived backgrounds to come through. Tricia may be able to give you some of the figures around the Commission's work, but, but it, it isn't simply a matter of the amount of funding per extra student that you include in funded places. Sorry, no, no I, don't, I don't have that, those, those figures. The only thing I wanted to add was the, the Commission make very clearly the point that this is a whole systems issue. Yeah. So it's starting from early years through school, through, through college, through universities. So it's not a just, you can't fix it as it were just in universities. So it's, it's kind of looking and planning across that whole system. Well, that, that, that's for some things, but in terms of just the capacity, in terms of places, that's not a whole system. That's a decision in terms of the availability of resources, surely. I mean, I accept that getting more people, more kids to up a higher percentage of kids to come from poorer backgrounds, that's a whole system approach, and that starts in primary. Mm -hmm. It starts probably even earlier than primary. Yeah, yeah. But in terms of funding, the capacity to keep pace with the increase in the applications, that's not nothing to do with primary education, that's a, a resource yeah. issue. Yeah. So what I'm trying to get at is um, everything else being equal. What, if you just had to close that gap and do it by additional money, what is the order of magnitude of the cost of closing the gap? Colleagues on my right are trying to contribute to that, so I'll ask Kirsty to come in. Yes, we uh, apologies. We don't. We didn't make. We haven't done that calculation. But but um, happy to come back to committee. The easy option is to multiply the amount of funding grant by the additional demand that sits there and calculate it that way. However, it's not quite as easy as that in terms of working out the levels of funding because it depends where the demand is directed. So some courses will be much more expensive, for example, medicine, than, say, your social sciences courses. So it is a, cal it is a more complicated calculation than perhaps the, 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 a very easy one. I'm suggesting it's easy, but I just wondered if you had an order of magnitude of how much it would take to close the gap. But it would be useful if, if you were able to give us an indication. I think that would be quite useful to get the follow-up to see what the funding gap is there. Uh, secondly, can I, can I ask, have you looked at productivity in the university sector? Uh, because uh, you know, I think that's a, an issue that certainly merits some investigation. Not in this audit. Um, you'll recognise it already covers quite a lot of ground and we were keen to keep it manageable. Um, the universities are required by the Funding Council to generate efficiency savings um, as part of their conditions of grant. Um, they've been of the level of 3% in recent years, um, but I think um, it's sort of taking further the um, recommendation from the Commission on Widening Access. There has to be a scope to look again at the way in which teaching and research are organised and funded, the extent of collaboration across universities, a whole range of things that would come into that question of productivity and efficiency and what we get for the money that's spent. And do we have too many universities in Scotland? I don't think that's a question that I can answer. 
Right, that was a nice way out of it. <laughs> <laughs> my final, my final question is um, obviously with Brexit. At some point in the next probably five years or so, um, we won't have the situation where um, we will have EU students getting free education in Scotland because obviously that was a consequence of the um, abolition of tuition fees. Uh, now, obviously, we want to maintain a very cosmopolitan and internationalist approach to recruiting students to come here, um, but clearly, um, at the moment, we fund EU students to come to Scottish universities. Um, when that finishes, uh, or, or just today, how much uh, does that cost the Scottish Government? One of my colleagues will be able to give me in a moment, I'm sure, a figure for the number of EU students who are funded by the Scottish Government. Um, before that, I just want to flag that it's not entirely a, a sort of one-way bet that the universities are concerned that they get a significant um, disproportionate share of EU research funding coming into Scotland. Yeah. And there's also a significant um, reliance, is the wrong word, that uh, many EU staff, research and teaching staff, come from the EU as well because of that. And, and there's a concern about the loss. But, but that's actually, if you look at, if you look at the spice briefing on EU funding, mm -hmm. actually, it's our money getting recycled back into Europe to come back to us, and it still leaves a surplus when you take everything, including cap and everything. We still have a surplus of £800 million a year, notionally, according Indeed. to spice. So, so the funding for that is available if we repatriate the EU funding back to the Scottish Parliament for our notional share. But that's not the case uh, with the funding for EU students. Mm -hmm. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not looking at this from the point of view as of wanting fewer students from Europe. I think the more students we have from Europe and the rest of the world, the better for the education system, the better for our economy and our society. But I'm just interested in the round figure of how much we actually spend on providing free higher education to EU students today. And I think Tricia has tracked the but, figure but down the number, for you. I have the number of students. So in 2014-15, there were 20,805 EU students um, and 29,000 students from, from other countries out with the EU. Students who get free edu higher education here, uh, what's the cost, to, what, what share of the budget? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Right, OK. In 2014-15, the government spent around just under £25 million on tuition fees for EU students. Thank you. That's all continue. OK, thank you. Alison Harris. Yes, good morning. Well, I also enjoyed your report. I thought it was very valuable. And I'm delighted that, you know, the Scottish higher education sector is doing so well and it's internationally renowned. That's something I'm very proud of as well. But I think when you read through your report, really going back to points that have been made earlier, the fact that you're stating that these, you know, the financial position is actually masking underlying risks, to me that is really, it, it's ringing alarm bells because I understand that it's spread between, you know, the older universities to the newer universities, etc. But do you, I mean, if we don't really address this now, we're really sitting with a potential crisis situation in, what, five, ten years' time? Is that something that you have any more thoughts on, or is it really just back to let's take it back to the government and the SFC? What, what do you feel? Um, I think we've tried to capture our thoughts in the recommendations, mm -hmm. um, that clearly there are real strengths in the sector. It's mm -hmm. one of the things Scotland can be most proud of, and there are these challenges facing the sector as a whole to some extent, but really focused on some particular universities that don't have access mm -hmm. to the same range of income as others. Um, now, the... Um, part of the challenge is to understand the interplay between the government's different policy priorities around uh, free tuition for all Scottish students, around widening access for students mm. from more deprived backgrounds, and continuing to fund world-class research. Understanding how those things interplay for the sector as a whole and for individual institutions is very important, as is, I think, understanding the impact of decisions about student support and tuition fees on the decisions that Scottish students and potential students make about where they want to apply. So we've tried to capture that in the recommendations. We don't think it's an easy fix, but absolutely sitting down now and understanding the way those things interact with each other um, and thinking through how that nearly £2 billion every year can be spent to the best effect mm. seems to us exactly the right thing to be doing. OK, so if we don't get it right, we do have a potential disaster. There are certainly okay. risks to okay. the sector and particularly to some institutions. Yes. Yeah. OK, thank you. 
I'd like to uh, ask a couple of questions around capital funding. I mean, given that we know how um, students are attracted to come to universities for, for multiple reasons, but obviously good facilities, um, attractive facilities, the, the capital funding reduction of 69% seems absolutely huge. Now, uh, Obviously, it's trumped by the 77% reduction in capital funding in the report we're about to look at from colleges. But can the panel tell me if there are any um, comparisons ac across the public sector in Scotland where we've seen such a huge reduction in capital funding? Um, I will ask colleagues in a moment if they've got any comparative figures. If not, we may be able to come back to the committee with it. Um, I think it is important for us to note that the Scottish Government's budget, um, which has been very largely funded through the um, block grant over the last uh, few years, has taken a very significant hit on capital funding, more so than on revenue funding. Um, if you look at Exhibit 12 in the report, you'll see that um, the drop in funding body grants has been... Um, counteracted to an extent by an increase in the use of internal funds, so their surpluses and reserves by universities, um, and an increase in um, borrowing and loan funding over the last couple of years particularly. Um, and we absolutely recognise how important that is, that universities need to make sure their estate is fit for purpose, um, that it continues to be fit for teaching and for research, which often brings very particular needs with it. Um, and it's that which enables them to attract both staff and students that, that affect their long-term sustainability. So it seems to us that's a really key key issue and it's why we focus so particularly on the importance of the funding council having a clear capital funding strategy for the way it will allocate that money to the universities um, over the medium term. Because you mentioned surpluses but I, I think we know that certain universities have uh, healthy surpluses but there are universities that, that don't. Um, uh, thinking of uh, my own university in, in Dundee which is currently uh, running a deficit but um, what um, what do you um, I mean in terms of um, equity across higher education how does that affect you know the quality of different universities is there not an inequity there I think it's another um, example of the way there is such variability across the sector as a whole. We know that um, Edinburgh and Glasgow account for a large part of the reserves that are available across Scotland. I think the figure as a whole is two and a half billion. Um, a large amount of that reflects... To uh, belongs to those two specific ancient universities. Um, and I think, as I said in response to Liam Kerr's question, um, there is that danger that the successful universities are able to invest on and build in their success, and the ones which have um, a greater reliance on public funding um, find it more difficult to, to um, invest in that way and therefore risk decline. Mm -hmm. um, it absolutely is a, a key part of the, the long-term sustainability of individual institutions. Can I ask also, um, I suppose to stick with sustainability, but um, we've heard from Liam Kerr raised, and I think importantly with you, the economic impact of uh, universities. And uh, I think as parliamentarians, we're all acutely um, aware of that. But And also the, um, government ministers and us as parliamentarians often trumpet the fact that we have so many uh, universities in the top, you know, uh, 10, uh, uh, sorry, um, top 100 uh, in the world. The, the reduction in research funding, how will that impact one, the economic impact of universities, and two, the standing of our universities in the world? Um, research success is key to both of those things. I will ask Kirsty, if I may, to talk through what's happening with the different streams of research funding, because it isn't only Scottish Government funding through the Funding Council that, that has an impact there. Indeed. Um, thank you. In terms of research funding, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's traditionally an activity that universities have struggled to, to recover their full economic cost. A lot of the funding streams are deliberately designed that it's not 100% of funding to cover that activity that is provided to universities. There's an element in built of efficiency to try and make universities um, basically de deliver efficiencies, if you will, in a, in a tight um, research budget then and a funding package, it places pressure, as the Auditor-General said, on universities' ability to be able to generate surpluses elsewhere in their activities to cover those costs. And, and as the different streams, as I mentioned earlier, 
a lot of charity research. You mentioned Dundee University. Dundee University is very, very successful in generating research income, but a lot of that comes from charity sources, which is making it very difficult for them to be able to, to continue to cover their costs. Um, similarly, Research Council and industry funding as well isn't 100% funding, therefore just continues to place additional pressure on universities to be able to generate those surpluses and make those efficiencies to try and basically continue their research output. So is there a risk that if they continue to attract good amounts of research funding, if the level of funding from uh, the Scottish Funding Council can't cover that 20%, is there a risk then that some of that research might go by the wayside, affect um, research standing of our universities in Scotland? It's really up to universities how they want to position themselves and how they develop their own financial strategies to address that. So universities will look at their own research profiles and identify, you know, where, where can we make surpluses? How do we want to attract alternative income? Say, for example, recruiting more students from non-EU countries to try and generate those surpluses. So it is up to individual, individual universities in terms of their own developing their own robust financial strategies. But the SFC also have a role, and as we say, in the report and recommend that they have a look across the sector at the risks and, and the different the information that's available so that those challenges can be identified. Okay, thank you very much. Do members have any further questions for the panel? Okay, I'd like to suspend while we change witnesses. Thank you all very much. is our evidence session on the Auditor General for Scotland's report entitled Scotland's Colleges 2016. The Auditor General is joined by Mark McPherson, Senior Manager and Stuart Nugent, Auditor Manager of Audit Scotland. Welcome. The Auditor General will now make an opening statement before I open up to questions from members. Thank you, Convener. Scotland's colleges have been through a period of major change, which I've reported on previously. Today's report provides an update on progress and implementing and managing these changes, including the impact on students and staff. It also comments on the sector's financial position and, again, the role of the Scottish Funding Council. While the merger process is now complete, colleges are continue, continuing to adjust to the changes, including regionalisation, reclassification as public bodies, and new funding and monitoring arrangements. Against this backdrop, the sector continues to exceed its national targets for the provision of learning. However, the Scottish Government is still not able to fully measure the benefits and costs of its merger programme, since some measures such as student destinations and employer engagement lack baseline information, it will now be difficult for the Government to demonstrate whether its reforms have delivered all of the expected benefits. Scotland now operates with 13 college regions, 13 of which contain more than one college. Only one of the three regional bodies was able to perform the role expected of it in 2014-15 and 2015-16. In terms of student participation, there is a mixed picture. The number of under-25-year-olds under in full-time college education has increased by 14% over the last 10 years. Over the same period, the total number of students has fallen by 41% and of part-time students by 48%. <coughs> Most of the redu reductions have been among women and people aged over 25. It's not possible to, to determine if these reductions reflect a fall in demand as data isn't collated at national level. The overall percentage of full-time FE students successfully completing their course increased year on year between 2009-10 and 2013-14, but then dropped slightly in 2014-15. Colleges told us that the amount of change in the sector, along with efforts to widen access to students from more deprived areas, contributed to that reduction. 
Information on Destinations for College Students was published for the first time this year. This showed that in 2013-14, at least 82% of students went on to education, training or employment. Staff numbers fell by 9% between 2011-12 and 2013-14, before increasing by 5% in 2014-15. Staff feedback on the impact of mergers is mixed. Some felt that mergers had been successful and cited benefits from sharing best practice and offering more opportunities for development, while others had concerns about the impact of voluntary severance and the reduced number of support staff on their workloads. The sector's financial position deteriorated in 2014-15. While the overall financial health of the sector is relatively stable, we have identified four colleges that face financial challenges. Colleges do not have long-term financial plans that would help them prepare for further financial pressures, such as national collective bargaining, estate maintenance and student support funding. I have reported previously on significant governance failings in a small number of colleges. The College Good Governance Task Group has published its recommendations now, and I think that they should mitigate the risk of significant governance failures in future. As you'd expect, the Scottish Funding Council undertakes regular monitoring of colleges. This has improved over time, but it hasn't always resulted in timely and effective resolution of problems. We found that the Scottish Government had not undertaken a comprehensive review of the Scottish Funding Council's role in the last 10 years, and we recommended that that should take place. Convener, my colleagues and I are happy to answer the, que the questions of the committee. Thank you very much. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Convener. I'm just contrasting the responses that uh, we've received from SFC and from government. Um, the SFC's responses seem fairly clear. They indicate very straightforwardly whether they agree with the recommendation. I'm less clear about the responses from the Scottish Government. They, they, they don't seem to be terribly clear. Um, I had the same reaction on reading the response, Mr Beattie, and I think it's a question you, the committee would need to direct to the government. I think it's possibly something the committee might want to take up. Um, I'm looking at uh, page 26, College Finances, uh, item, item three in the key messages, about depreciation. What is complex about depreciation and the way that the Scottish Government approached that? I knew this would be an area you'd want to drill into. Depreciation itself, I think, isn't complex to accountants and people who understand it. Um, that's, that's not many people in the world, and I respect that, but it's a, a straightforward way of recognising the fact that fixed assets deteriorate in value over time and that there's a cost to that. The way in which depreciation has been funded in colleges in the past has been unusual, and the change to them being classified as uh, public bodies has added to the complexity around that, and I'm going to ask Stuart to talk you through it. Yeah, prior to being reclassified, um, colleges were provided with uh, cash funding to cover all elements of cost, um, which included depreciation. Um, as depreciation was not a, a cash spend, then colleges were free to, to save that money and put, put towards their reserves, or were free to spend it. Um, if they spent it, it would result in a deficit. Um, following reclassification, colleges can no longer um, apply that to their reserves. Um, they, they can still spend that money, but if they do, the, it will result in a deficit um, as before. Um, however, the Scottish Government um, approved certain items of expenditure which they, they could spend that cash on, such as student support payments, uh, repayment of loans and specific regional pressures. If the, the, non, the, if the, the cash which was um, set, set aside for depreciation was spent on these items, that would result in a technical deficit. Um, which the, the government um, would understand and would accept as such and not as a, a, a normal operating deficit. So that's the, the difference between the before and after reclassification. Hmm. That, that does make it a bit odd. Um, how, what's the total value of that? Um, the total value in 2014-15 was, including the repayments of uh, loan uh, debt, was £17 million. Not, not a small sum for the colleges. Can, can I ask about uh, something we've spoken about before, which is ALFs? What's, what are colleges doing now with ALFs? I know when they were set up, they moved initial funding into the, into the ALFs to avoid losing it. Um, are they still putting money into ALFs? Have you looked at ALFs at all? 
We have. We've looked at part of our review of the accounts for 2014-15, um, and Mark will talk you through the changes we've seen this year. Yeah, so colleges are still uh, transferring money into ALFs. Um, 7 million, I think, is the figure for 14-15. Um, as far as we can determine, uh, ALFs are operating as, we, as they were intended. Colleges are paying money in and are making applications, and in most cases, I think, are receiving the money back from the ALFs. It remains the case that colleges may be refused in their applications, and that has happened in a few colleges, and that other bodies can apply to the ALFs and secure the money, providing it is for the uh, intended purposes of further education, which has happened in a few cases too. So where did the £7 million come from? Um, colleges can still generate surpluses and they will make an estimate at a certain point in the year about how much they think they may be able to transfer into the ALF, um, I, I, I guess you would say for safekeeping, if, if you can guarantee they'll get it back. So it would uh, be public funds that they're putting uh, into these ALFs? Well, colleges can generate their own income, of course. So um, it's, it's still some, public money? Uh, well even if it's from commercial operations? Well, I, th I think it depends on how they've generated it. Presumably, they, if they can fund it from the commercial income, they can fund the delivery of the, the whatever it is they've been paid to deliver then. Mm, it's within I think that's their... more than just a grey area. They're, they're public institutions, if they generate income, it becomes public funding, surely. As we discussed in relation to Cope Bridge College with the committee in the last session, um, colleges generally aren't able to account for their funding as being either public or private. There's, there's generally a good deal of allocation of costs between different headings. Um, and colleges are accountable for um, the funding that they receive from the funding council. So I think the overall management of their budgets is a matter of proper public interest and interest to this committee. So is the, is the amount of funds in the ALFs increasing? I think it decreased over the period since last year. Obviously, they made a large uh, transfer in the first year that they were uh, mm -hmm. they existed because they had reserves that they were able to transfer. Now they're obviously operating on a year-to-year -year basis, and so the amounts that they're able to transfer are smaller. And as we talk about in the report, uh, when we talk about capital funding, it's clear that they obviously have to rely on some of the funding that is sitting in the office to pay for some of the changes that they want to implement. And so over time, I would expect that the, the funds in ALFs will uh, reduce. But it's something that Audit Scotland will keep an eye on. Absolutely. Yeah. The other thing is SFC, which keeps coming up in these reports. Um, on page uh, 35, you say SFC's role in regulating college governance is not clear. And as you say, it's not effective in some issues. We've seen that. Is there indications it's getting better? Um, we say in the report, and I said in my opening statement, that we think they have got more effective at monitoring what's happening in colleges. Um, and it's not always clear that their monitoring has led to the resolution of problems rather than just the identification of them. We saw a good example of that in Cope Bridge. Um, it's also true, though, that the Funding Council's role has expanded quite markedly over the last few years with big changes in both the Funding Council and the, the further education and the higher education sectors that it's responsible for. Um, and that's why I've recommended that the government should review its role um, and how well equipped it is to carry that role out. Is it... Uh any conflict of interest that uh, SFC is eff effectively becoming increasingly a regulator as well as the organisation which dispenses funding? I don't think so. I think that colleges um, and indeed higher education institutions are accountable to the funding council for the money that it distributes on behalf of the government. Um, it doesn't seem to me um, a conflict of interest that the Funding Council is monitoring uh, their financial health and, and how well they're fulfilling the conditions of funding. Um, but I do, do think, as I said in this report and the higher education report, there's room for them to do that in a more strategic way. Okay. Monica Lennon. Thank you, convener. You recommended last year that the government and the Funding Council should publish financial information on the costs and savings achieved through the merger process. And on page uh, 12, I think it is, you say that many of the costs of the merger, such as from harmonisation of pay and other costs, were not included in the SFC assessments. What other factors have been omitted from those calculations? 
The um, Funding Council has now published its summary um, of the costs and benefits of uh, the merger programme. We think there are two broad areas where it doesn't provi provide full information that we'd expect to see. The first is, as you've identified, the full cost of the mergers themselves, and particularly the cost of um, harmonising terms and conditions across the colleges that have merged, which is potentially quite significant. Mm. The second is in terms of the benefits that mergers were intended to achieve, where there is some good information and some very good examples of where colleges are working better after mm. merger, but there isn't baseline information on some, port on some important questions. Um, I I think the team will keep me straight, but for students, the question of their destinations and their satisfaction with their studies, and for employers, um, the measures of employer engagement. The evaluation says that there are improvements in employer engagement, but there's no baseline to compare that to. And we think without that full picture, it's very hard to be clear what the full costs were and whether the intended benefits have been achieved. Okay, so in the absence of that baseline information, it's just not possible to establish if the estimated £50 million savings have been achieved? It, it's, not, it's difficult to be clear whether the full benefits have been achieved, um, and it's not clear whether the full costs, the full costs haven't been captured. Um, with the evaluation takes account of the amount of money which, money which the Funding Council provided directly to colleges to support mergers, but we know that colleges incurred costs themselves in significant areas like harmonising the terms and conditions of their staff, and that information hasn't been captured and played into the evaluation. Yeah. So, will it be possible, do you think, to fully capture all of that information, or is it too late to go back and, and get all that baseline it, it's a good question, and it's why we've been recommending it for the last couple of years. In some ways, um, it should be possible to go back and calculate the cost information, although the further out you get, the more difficult that gets. Mm -hmm. At this point, I think it would be very difficult to go back and generate the baseline information that wasn't co collected in the first place. Um, we've been reporting on um, reform programmes across the public sector for a while and have been clear from the start about the need to have good baselines so you can see what's changed as a result. That didn't happen in this case, and it will be difficult now to go back and generate that baseline information. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that it will be difficult to provide evidence that the original aims of this whole process have been fully achieved? I, I think the longer we go from the point yeah. of mergers, the more difficult it gets, yes. Okay. Um, the report, you know, you report um, big falls in certain subject areas um, due to uh, cuts in part-time places. I think exhibit... Four on page 19 illustrates that uh, very well. So we see courses like computing and health have fallen by almost half, so it's, it's quite significant. And in your statement, you talked about the reduction in part-time students and the, the gender <coughs> dimension to that. 53% of that decrease is, is women. Looking at these courses in Exhibit 4, what is the impact of the cuts to these particular subjects? Um, is there a vocational aspect to, to many of these courses? And, and do we know what students are doing now to acquire the skills that they, they would have perhaps obtained through these courses? Stuart, Stuart to come in in a moment. Um, I think it's worth saying um, initially that the changes to a great extent reflect the government's policy decision to focus funding on courses that were likely to full-time courses that were likely to lead to a qualification leading to employment um, and therefore they're likely to be vocational courses that are, are gaining or directly vocational courses. Um, one of our concerns is that there wasn't a full impact of both that change and the Funding Council's later um, funding change on what it meant for students. Um, and we don't have an overall picture in Scotland of demand for further education to know what's happening to the students who are displaced by this process. Um, but I'll ask Stuart to pick up the question. Okay. Um, yeah, one of the recommendations we have in our report is that the Funding Council um, should look to assess the, the demand for um, college places, um, which would allow us to, to answer the question of um, what has happened to the students who no longer attend college. Are they still applying? Um, so at the current time, there isn't a national picture of demand um, for college places across the country. Um, individual colleges do have their own information systems, but there's not a national picture, so we, we have made that recommendation in light of that. Okay. Liam. Uh, really, just a quick follow-up question on that. Um, 
on, on what Monica was asking, the, you talk about the student numbers decreasing, uh, and particularly amongst women and people aged over 25. Uh, but you said in your statement that the data is not collated at national level. Um, are you able to say categorically why these reductions have happened? Yes, in um, paragraph uh, 28 and onwards, we talk about the policy changes that led to these changes. Um, in 2009, the Scottish Government asked the Funding Council to focus its funding on courses that were most likely to lead to employment. Um, and that led to less funding for courses that didn't lead to a recognised qualification or that were less than 10 hours in duration. Now, that's an entirely appropriate policy choice for a government to make. It's what governments are for. Um, the, um, there's also been a, a, a shift in um, the way in which the funding is allocated through into the funding policy uh, for the way students are ca counted, and that's had an impact as well. So we think that's what's behind it. What we're concerned about is that the government didn't carry out an, an impact assessment in advance of what was likely to happen to the people who weren't able to gain places in further education as a result of that. And because, as Stuart said, information on demand for FE courses isn't collected across Scotland, although individual um, colleges have their own information, they don't know if a student they turned down for a place went to a college somewhere else, so we don't have that overall picture. We're not clear whether this is people who've, who simply moved somewhere else or who are now not able um, to access further education that they would have been able to before the policy change that come in. Mm -hmm. Is there more to say on that, Stuart? Uh, no. No? no. Okay. Okay. Um, can I ask, to turn to the recommendations uh, in the report, uh, you've said that um, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Funding Council should work with colleges to determine the current condition of the college estate uh, and prepare a plan to ensure that it's fit for purpose. Is there a concern that the College Estate across Scotland isn't fit for purpose? I think we just we just don't have the data. Um, clearly in the report we talk about some work that the Scottish Funding Council has undertaken to try and make some assessment of the areas where there's been less investment. Um, but I think, as our recommendation suggests, I think they need to make a, a, a proper analysis across the piece. I'm sure that at individual college level, many colleges will have made an assessment of their own estate, but I think that needs to be brought together to allow any funding decisions to be made uh, on the basis of a solid evidence base. Was your concern about the college estate driven by the 77% reduction in, in capital funding for colleges? Oh, I'd, I don't think we've necessarily got a specific concern about the college estate. What we're concerned about is when there's a limited amount of capital investment available, you need to make best use of that. And if no one has a clear picture of the overall state of the estate over the whole country, then it might be difficult to allocate funding that does become available. Mm -hmm. I mean, similar to the question I asked in, in the previous item about capital spending, you explained why there's been a reduction in capital spending. But, I mean, in terms of comparison across other public sector bodies, have, have any other public sector bodies in Scotland experienced this reduction, this huge reduction, 77% in capital spend? We will, as we said earlier, come back to the committee with any detailed comparisons we can provide, but we know that the Scottish Government's overall capital Dell budget reduced more significantly than its revenue budget did over the period since 2010. Mm -hmm. um, and different public bodies have different ways of compensating for that. At the moment, uh, councils are really the only bodies that can borrow mm -hmm. um, and uh, have used that to continue investing in their capital assets over the last period. Other bodies haven't had the same um, ability to do so. There has been some investment through things like public-private partnerships in some of the college estate, but as Mark said, what we don't have is that picture, as we do have for the NHS, for example, where there's a, a regular condition survey that gives the assurance that the, the estate's fit for purpose or gives an estimate of how much investment is needed to bring it up to an acceptable condition. Mm -hmm. I mean, I noticed uh, from uh, page 26 that the Scottish Government is now looking to PPP to... Uh, in the future to uh, sort of mitigate some of those uh, capital uh, funding cuts. Do you think their plan of 300 million is going to be sufficient? Or is it hard to say? At the moment, we just don't know. Yeah. Without that regular condition survey, it's difficult to be clear what is needed. At the moment, the plans are centred on public-private partnerships because that's the only way the government has had to complement its capital allocation through the block grant. 
from next year there will be new borrowing powers for the Scottish Government under the Scotland Act 2016. Um, but all of that has long-term revenue consequences. So the Government and the Funding Council need to be clear right across the budget of where the priorities are for investment um, and what the long-term effect is of, of paying that back in inverted commas. Mm -hmm. I'm just interested that this, the government always tell us that they've moved away completely from PPP, but it's clearly not the case from this um, report. You, can I return to the reduction in overall student numbers? You said 41% reduction overall. And from Exhibit 9, uh, it's clear that overall funding to the college sector has reduced. It looks from the graph to about the tune of 150 million uh, since 2009-10. So that reduction in spending and reduction in students, I mean, is it fair to say that the college sector has taken a huge cut? The reduction in funding to the college sector has been very significant, more, more significant obviously than we've seen in the health service and I think in local government as well. Um, the government has had to um, respond to a very significant reduction in the budget it has available since 2010 because of the very direct relationship between the UK government's budget and the block grant that funds Scottish government services and choices have to be made in that. Um, I think it's a question for government about how they've made the decisions on allocation looking backwards and obviously looking forward in, in future budget discussions as they take place. Um, I think it's, it's important also to note that the reduction hasn't only reflected a reduction in funding, it has reflected a shift in policy, as Mr Kerr was asking about earlier, um, with a reduction in the number of um, people, but a significant increase in the number of full-time students coming through there of 14% over the same period. Mm -hmm. I noted what you said earlier, Auditor General, about it's not possible to see if there's a reduction in demand. There's been a reduction of 41% in students, but you don't have the data to show reduction in demand. I mean, locally, I, over the years, have seen uh, numbers of applications. I mean, why aren't these collected? Surely that would be a priority for government in terms of funding places at college to have a clear idea of how many students want to, or how many young people or any people want to go to college. Why isn't that information collected? We think it's really important that it should be. As you say, individual colleges obviously know how many applications they receive, how many offers they make, and how many students accept those offers. What they don't know, though, is that if they don't make an offer or a student doesn't accept an offer, whether that person is... is doing nothing or if they're moving to another college um, to take the same course or a different course. Um, we do have that information for higher education in Scotland. We think it's important that we have it for further education, both because of the shift in policy we're seeing here and because of the increasing recognition that the link between school and college and higher education is really important in terms of people being able to fulfil their potential however well they do in their early years. So the gov is that one of your recommendations that the government need to yes, it is. collect applications? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So it's quite possible that there are hundreds if not thousands of students that want to go to college but can't go to college in Scotland, that it's, we just don't know? It, it's possible but we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, it is, it's equally possible um, that those students have managed to access um, further education in a different college, perhaps doing the course they wanted to or, or a, a second preference. It's possible they've gone into employment of some sort, but without collecting that information across Scotland, we don't know. And that seems to us the key thing the Funding Council should be um, resolving with colleges as a matter of urgency. If higher education has collected this data for so long, why, haven't, why hasn't further education? There is a system to do it across Scotland um, for higher education. There hasn't been for colleges. Um, they've been seen as being much more local institutions in the past. Um, and the way the funding has worked has, has, for students has made, made that it's not had the same priority. Um, it now does, clearly, for all the reasons we've been discussing this morning. Okay. Members, have any further questions? Can I just ask a yeah. couple of questions? Um, well, obviously, the whole thrust of the policy change um, was to uh, get a closer uh, alignment between college courses and employment. And 82% uh, in the latest available figure, 82% of leavers had a, from college had a positive destination. How does that compare to the same figure in 2009 when the new policy was introduced? 
Um, the information was published for the first time for 2013-14, right. um, and I think we saw a very slight reduction between 2013-14 and 2014-15. Right. Um, it's not clear what the reasons for that reduction are, um, but obviously it is an early warning that the colleges and the funding council should be paying attention to to make right. sure that the policy is having the desired effect. But we don't know what the destination figure was before the policy was changed. 2013-14 is the first right. um, time okay. the information was published. The other figure that struck me was the dropout rate. Um, you know, although it's improved from 59% to 64%, slipped back a wee bit uh, in the last year, but that still represents, even in the best year, a 36% dropout rate. Um, that's very wasteful, isn't it? Uh, why, why do you think the dropout rate is so high and what can we do to reduce it? We haven't had the chance to look at it in detail yet. Um, I think we heard from colleges that um, the changes that were going on in the system and the um, attempts to widen access of students may both be contributing to it. Um, but it's one of the reasons why having the data is so important and why colleges and the funding council should be exploring what's happening across Scotland and in individual colleges so that we can reverse the trend, as you yeah. say. It's not good for the students. It's not a good use of the public money that government's spending in this area. And addressing that has to be a priority. I would have thought so, yeah. yeah. Good. OK. Thank you very much for your evidence on that. I'm going to suspend until the next item. Thank you.
I move to item number three, which is our evidence session on the Auditor General, Auditor General for Scotland's report entitled, um, sorry, I'm on the wrong one. Item four, um, in section 22 report, one entitled the 2014-15 audit of Edinburgh College and the other entitled the 2014-2015 audit of Glasgow College's regional board. The Auditor General is joined by Mark Roberts, Senior Manager of Audit Scotland, Mark McPherson, Senior Manager of Audit Scotland, Hugh Harvey, partner at KPMG, and Gary Devlin, partner at Scott Moncrief. I now invite the Auditor General to make her opening statement, which will cover both audits before I open up to questions from members. Thank you, convener. Um, I'm briefing the committee this morning, as you say, on two reports that I've prepared under Section 22 of the Public Finance and Accountability Scotland Act 2000. The first of these is a report on the 2014-15 audit of Edinburgh College. Edinburgh College was formed in 2012 by the merger of Jewel and Esk, Telford and Stevenson Colleges. Although the auditor gave an unqualified opinion on Edinburgh College's financial statements for 2014-15, his annual report highlighted that the college had experienced financial difficulties at the end of that financial year. This was the result of the college failing to meet its activity targets for 2014-15 and led to the Scottish Funding Council seeking to recover £800,000 from the college in November 2015. Following confirmation from the Funding Council that it was seeking to recover those funds, the principal initiated a detailed review to better understand the reasons for the failure to meet the target. That review highlighted a number of underlying problems, including issues with student rec recruitment and retention. The findings led to the college negotiating a 6% reduction in its 2015-16 target, with an associated reduction in funding. The college's scope to reduce its fixed costs was limited, and the funding reduction led to a funding gap of £2.5 million for that year. This placed the college in severe financial difficulty. My report on Edinburgh College was laid in Parliament in March this year. Since then, the college has developed a transformation plan to address the issues identified in the principal's review. The Funding Council has agreed to provide transitional funding support to help the college to implement the plan. The plan envisages that the college will return to a surplus position in 2018-19. I've asked the auditor to monitor developments and to report on progress as part of the annual audit, and I'll report again early in 2017. Alongside me is Hugh Harvey from KPMG, who is the auditor for the college, and Mark McPherson, who you know is a senior manager with Audit Scotland. With your permission, convener, I'll pause there and we'll answer questions about that report and then introduce the Glasgow College's regional board separately as they cover quite different issues. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Colin Beattie. Um, obviously, the report that we have in front of us is fairly brief. Um, I, for one, might have appreciated and realised this came from the audit of Edinburgh College rather than an audit Scotland intervention as such. Um, I would have uh, liked to have had a bit more information around how actually this took place and a bit more on the timelines under which it, it took place. Um, anecdotally, I've been told it happened under previous management. I, I, I can't tell really from this whether that, that's the case or not. Uh, are there any plans to do more detailed investigation? Uh, we, can, we can certainly provide you with more information in answer to questions this morning, and as I say, I will report again on progress with this particular case. I think it's fair to say that the problems came to light quite late in the, um, the financial year under audit, um, and that's limited the extent to which it's been possible to report, given this timeline, on the history of what's happened. Uh, but Hugh might want to say something more about the, um, what's, what's come to light about the problems since it was identified at the end of the 14-15 financial year. Hugh. Yes, the, the, the main issue that uh, has arisen is in relation to the college's ability uh, to meet its liabilities as they fall due, if I, uh, putting it quite simply. Um, the activity levels uh, within the college upon which it is funded um, had fallen below those which were forecast, and as a result, the funding it was able to claim from uh, the Scottish Funding Council uh, reduced the college still had a large uh, cost base, one which uh, supported a higher level of activity. Um, and as a result, with reduced funding and a too high a cost base, there are uh, clearly issues um, in the look forward period. 
I recognise from the report here that uh, it's uh, from the college failing to deliver the agreed activity. It's really the reasons for that, what led up to that, how did they get in that state? Did it happen gradually? Did it happen overnight? Was it one particular year that it went wrong? You know, there's a lot of questions here. There are, and I do recognise the report is brief. That reflects the way in which the problem came to light as a result of a grant claim from the Funding Council. The core of the issue is a shift in the um, funding priorities from the Funding Council. Um, in the past, colleges have been able to claim for activity almost regardless of which students that activity related to. Um, and there was a widespread practice called additionality, where colleges could claim funding for a student who was effectively meeting the full-time minimum requirements. The college would then deliver additional learning to that student and could claim additional funding for that additional activity as part of the policy to make sure that the funding was achieving the best impact in terms of equipping as many students as possible um, to move into employment. The Funding Council removed that ability to, to fund additionality and instead required more students to be recruited and retained to generate the same level of funding. Um, the uh, newly formed Edinburgh College, I think, didn't fully understand the extent to which it was relying on funding through additionality to um, cover its cost base. Um, as the merger uh, worked through and the information came to light, it became clear that there was a problem of about 800,000 relating to grant funding to, for 14-15. And again, further investigations showed that was a much bigger problem going ahead, um, which the college and the funding council have tried to work together to resolve. Um, but it is an emerging picture and that's why the report that was laid in March is quite high level. We've clearly done work since then to explore the issue and I will report again early in 2017 about it but it's been an emerging picture for the college and the funding council as well as for us. Given the the nature of the problem is it possible that other colleges might have the same difficulty and that hasn't come to light yet? The same question occurred to us, to us as you'd expect. I'll ask Mark to talk you through what we've done in that area. Yeah, we're aware from discussions with the Funding Council that Edinburgh College wasn't the only college that used additionality, and indeed um, it, the use of additionality has not been outlawed as such. It's just been limited. Uh, they've placed a limit on it to try and encourage colleges to focus on individual students and additional students rather than additional activity. I don't think we've got a, the, the data to hand about how widespread it might be in other colleges, but we understand from the discussions with the Funding Council that Edinburgh was a, a was essentially an outlier in terms of the amount of additionality that it was using to, to bolster its activity. Did F SFC do any assessment as to the risk involved in such a fundamental change to the way that business was being conducted and the possible impact on colleges, including Edinburgh? I think that's a question you'd have to ask them. Um, as, as I say, we understand the policy um, basis for the shift. The extent to which they carried out a full assessment of the risks associated with it isn't something that I think we can answer to the committee's satisfaction. Anything you want to add to that, Mark? No. This was a decision of SFC, not the Scottish Government? Or did it come from the Scottish Government? I think it was a decision from the Funding Council in 2014 that relates again to the government's policy priority of focusing funding on helping as many students as possible to gain qualifications that will help them into employment. It links back to the increasing focus on full-time students rather than part-time students and on courses that lead to a qualification. SFC that interpreted it in that way and sought to implement policy by making this change? That's my understanding. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Liam? Yes, on that point, uh, just so I'm absolutely clear, because I think uh, Colin raises valid concerns. So what we've got is a college that is in financial difficulty. Uh, there is a move to recover £800,000 due to this additionality, which has been done uh, or the additionality better prepares the students for the workplace. Uh, and you mentioned in your answer to Colin that uh, that policy shift has come because the colleges are trying to get more students recruited to get the funding. So in other words, we're trying to put more students through the system rather than better prepare the ones we've got for the workplace and that's why there's now a problem. Now is that, so that's a policy decision by the Scottish Government or the Scottish Funding Council? 
And in any event, is recouping that 800,000 really what the SFC should be doing in the circumstances? There's a lot of questions in that. I'll make a start and then ask Mark to come in behind me. The starting point of this, I think, is um, the point we were discussing in relation to my earlier report this morning. Um, in 2009, the government asked the Funding Council to focus its funding on courses that were most likely to lead to employment. That led to less funding for courses that didn't lead to a qualification and less funding to shorter courses. Um, and uh, was one of the drivers behind the increase in the number of full-time students and the reduction in the number of part-time students that we've seen over that period. In 2014, the Scottish Funding Council introduced new guidance to help ensure that colleges place an emphasis on increasing the number of students that they recruit rather than the amount of learning that the students they've already recruited um, experience or benefit from. Um, so the previous practice of recruiting a student who met the minimum requirements for full-time st study and then providing those students with more learning and receiving more funding for it was moved away from and instead the focus was on recruiting more individual students who each met the full-time minimum threshold. Um, and the, during the process of merger, Edinburgh College, I think, didn't fully understand the impact of that change on their, their funding model. Um, it became clear towards the end of the 2014-15 financial year that they were therefore at risk of overclaiming funding from the Funding Council under the old model. And when they thought that through, they recognised the impact on their funding for future years, which gave them this much bigger funding gap that needed filled. They've been working with the Funding Council to understand that and to manage the financial implications of it, but it's one of those um, misunderstood policy changes that's had a particular impact on this college and that can't be easily undone in a single financial year. Do you want to add to that, Mark? Yeah, just a couple of points. I think just to emphasise again that the additionality that we talk about is a legitimate use of uh, funding and activity that the Funding Council has not uh, said that <coughs> colleges shouldn't do it. I think it wants to understand very clearly why they're doing it and whether that might be at the expense of giving other students an opportunity to participate in learning and to qualify. Um, you asked a question as well about the 800k. Um, the current situation, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but is that the Funding Council has not recovered the 800k, it has decided to allow the college to retain that in order to implement parts of the transformation plan. I think it's very important to emphasise that the college has still got a difficult period ahead of it and has still got a lot of work to do and the Funding Council and we will be keeping a close eye on that. Are you able to tell us what, what, what learning is being captured out of this so in, in order that it doesn't happen again? Clearly, it is not impossible that there will be similar shifts in the future, similar uh, institutional <coughs> movements. Uh, how do we ensure this does not happen again and who will be taking the learning from this? Um, I think I don't think we are entirely well cited, as, as the Auditor General has mentioned, about the you know what consultation or engagement with the sector took place before the change was made. I'm pretty sure that the Funding Council will have acknowledged this, and I'm pretty sure that other colleges who maybe have, have in the past relied on additionality or have made use of additionality will be looking closely at their own circumstances to understand that would work. Um, so I would see it as a role for the Funding Council and colleges themselves to be reflecting on the learning from this particular college. I, I, thank you for that. I, I don't just mean on the the additionality and things. I mean in general, uh, when an in, th there is a situation at the Edinburgh College, uh, what is being done to ensure that the learning outcomes from that process in general will not happen the next time that there is such a merger? In general terms, I think there are two points we've taken from it that we've tried to play through our reports on the college sector as a whole. The first is that um, reform programmes, particularly those involving mergers, are times of higher risk um, and things can go wrong, whether it's people misunderstanding their, their funding models, problems around voluntary severance, letting staff go with redundancy packages. We've seen problems in all of those areas and we've reported previously that the Funding Council could have done more to help and support colleges through that process. The second, I think, relates specifically to the policy change that happened in 2009. Um, and as I said in the earlier agenda item, we, we don't think that the Funding Council did enough work to fully understand the potential impact of a, a very um, appropriate and well-intentioned policy change towards focusing on getting people into employment. At the same time, it's important to understand the impact on other people affected by that policy. And I think the same is true here. Um, 
both of those underlie the recommendations that we've made to the government and particularly the Funding Council about reviewing the role of the Funding Council and it's what it's expected to do and how well equipped it is to carry out that role. Thank you. Okay, Alison Harris. Yeah, yeah, I just really wanted, if I picked up your figures correctly, you said that the college you know, didn't have the money, wouldn't meet its liabilities. However, by 1819, it's going to be in a surplus. So that's quite a quick turnaround in only, what, two financial years, really? Um, I'll yeah. start off, and Hugh yeah. may want to add to what I say. Um, the, our sense is that the college has, re has responded to this problem right. very quickly and very thoroughly. Um, yeah. The principal, who is relatively new, um, as soon as the problem was identified, um, initiated a very wide-ranging review to understand what had happened yeah. and make sure the problem was fully understood. Um, they have engaged with the Funding Council to agree a short-term funding um, solution to get them through, and they've got a transformation plan in place which they expect to return them to a surplus by 2018-19. Like you, I think that's ambitious. I hope they can do it, and there's an awful lot that's required to do it over that time scale. Um, Hugh, as the appointed auditor, will be keeping a very close eye on progress, um, and I'll be reporting back uh, to this committee at the end of each audit um, to bring you up to speed with how well it's going. Um, I hope, in terms of success, but equally, if there are problems, I'll make sure the committee is aware of that. Okay, thank you. you. Do you want to add anything? It, the only point I would add um, is that during the transformational plan, the costs are higher um, because of the costs of the voluntary severance. Uh, that will uh, are part of the plan and uh, are inevitable when you're trying to reduce the cost base in an organisation. Um, but once those additional costs are incurred, then okay. the savings identified okay. should okay, get so them back to surplus. That's good. So we're, they're on the case, really. Very much yeah, so. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Alex Neil. Can I just clarify a couple of things? Uh, first of all, what was the timeline between the funding council and they take the point they hadn't consulted on it but once they take the decision they then presumably inform the colleges through the guidance uh, of the change of policy so what was the time gap between the funding council informing the colleges of the change in policy through guidance and the college realizing that it was engaging in something that was no longer acceptable practice Relatively short, I think. The new guidance was introduced in June 2014, and this problem arose towards the end of the 14-15 financial year as the college was finalising its funding claim to the Funding Council. Mark? Yeah, I think that's right. I, I don't think between the formal guidance being issued and uh, uh, the, the, the college uh, embarking on its next uh, academic year, there was a particularly big time gap. Um, I think what's a bit unclear is how much consultation and uh, notification there was in advance of the formal change being introduced. I, I, accept, I accept the point about consultation, and clearly one of the lessons is the SFC needs to consult before it makes a decision in these matters. But once it made the decision, you're saying it was a short time frame between the SFC get new guidance coming out and the college realising that it had to change its practice. If it was such a short time frame, why is there so much money involved? I think because Edinburgh College is a big college. It's one of the largest ones in Scotland now. 800,000 was the amount for that initial year. So it, it's significant, but it's not a, a huge sum of money. It's when you roll it up to a full academic year and looking ahead, you get to the two and a half million gap, which is what we the have practice, here. practice more or less whenever they realised their mistake, did they not? Sorry, I missed the beginning of that question, Mr. When Neil. the college realised their mistake, mm. did they not very quickly stop the practice of additionality? It's quite difficult to stop it in the middle of a financial year when you've already rec recruited students right. um, to your courses in a particular but, but way. But I think Mark said it was near the end of the financial year when they discovered it, right? Yeah, well, so so just, just to be clear what you're saying here, because something here doesn't quite add up in my mind at the moment. In, in June, I think you said, the SFC decision was notified to the colleges. Is that right? And presumably the college financial year is April to, to the end of March, April to April. End of July. So, so it was notified in June For the before the start of the new financial year? Uh, yes. But it wasn't so, picked up until near the end of the financial year? Uh, there were discussions <coughs> ongoing between the college and the SFC at various points, as there normally is, I think, between co individual colleges and SFC to monitor performance and progress towards delivering the activity targets that have been agreed. Um, I think at various points throughout the year, the college was... Uh, 
operated on the belief that it was going to deliver and all of the activity would be eligible for uh, funding from the SFC. And only when the final checks were conducted at the, towards the end of the year did it become apparent that a, a proportion of the activity that the college expected to claim for and had delivered would not be eligible for SFC funding, which then triggered the, the so, SFC. So there were prior checks during the financial year and nobody picked up the discrepancy? I think at that, well, I think at that stage the, the, the checks are not are obviously based on activity at a particular point in time, but activity runs throughout the whole of the financial year. But it's still a check. Yeah, I, I don't know about the level of detail of the check at that point. They're subject so to who it. does the check, the college or the auditor? It's usually internal audit. It's internal. Yeah. The internal auditor in the college? Yes, the, the college has um, internal monitoring systems and then the internal auditor carries out a check on the claim at the end of the financial year. Well, is one of the lessons not to the internal auditor in future to be much more thorough in what they're doing and actually check <laughs> that they're following the guidance issued by the SFC? That, that, that would require them to carry out their work throughout the year, uh, whereas, as I understand it, they're engaged at the, at the end of the year as the claims are But is there not a lesson in there about internal management of the audit function? Because clearly, had a more robust audit function, internal audit function, been operating, presumably this would have been, or the chances are this would have been picked up at a much earlier stage. I think there's a lesson about the um, college's overall system for making sure that it's managing its finances properly. You're absolutely right that the college needs to have a system to make sure that the assumptions it's made about the funding it will receive from the funding council and from other sources are um, rolling up during the year as expected and that they're being properly claimed. This college chooses to have internal audit to do that check at the year end. I think there's a very um, strong question about whether for colleges that have got such complex sets of income streams, their systems are robust enough to, to pick up problems during the year as they come through. Yeah, I mean, surely in any robust audit system, this should have been picked up much earlier. It depends what the internal auditors are asked to do. I, I, I expect that in this case the internal auditors are a firm who are appointed by the college to do a specific task. The college remains responsible for the quality of its internal controls and the systems of assurance that it has. Um, and it sounds as though that system may need to be reviewed to make sure it's fit for but purpose in future. But if the college the employed an external auditor, surely the external auditor would have checked the guidance from SFC as part of their, their work. I think Hugh's point is about the timing of that check. If they're being asked to do it as a final check before submission, it may pick up problems too late for there to be any um, adjustment made to the, both the income and the expenditure projections that the college but has. It, but is it not a basic Auditor General to check that the income expected fits in with the guidance provided by your substantially main funder? It, it absolutely is, Mr Neil. I agree I with you. I think the auditors I'm, have had something to answer for here as well, do they not? The, I don't, I don't know the detail of the way Edinburgh College organises its internal audit, but in any organisation, internal audit is there to support management and the board by providing assurance about the governance systems they have in place. And it's answer the governance system, of which internal audit as a part, hasn't operated as well as it needs to in this case. So there's a lesson to improve internal audit? Internal audit as part of the system of internal controls and yeah. assurance, I yeah. think, yes. Because it failed? The system of internal controls and assurance, I think, failed. Yeah. yeah. Any further questions on the Edinburgh report? Colin. Just on the back of, uh, of what Alec was asking there, in most businesses of any size, they don't have a snapshot audit at the end of the year. They have an ongoing audit through the year, which of course makes the year-end audit a great deal easier and quicker. Uh, typically, maybe quarterly or something, the auditors do an update. Is this not the the, the common thing in the public sector? The auditors that I appoint, absolutely it is. The work will normally take place in at least two chunks. There'll be some work during the financial year, which is looking at the systems um, for uh, controlling um, expenditure and risk and uh, the process of financial management during, and then a shorter financial statements audit after the year end that produces the audit opinion that I use to report to this committee when needed. That's not necessarily the case for internal audit. Normally the situation with internal audit is that an internal audit plan is approved by the audit committee at the beginning of the financial year, and that will contain six, seven, eight internal audits that are phased throughout the year and will report back as they're completed. 
And I think there's an important difference that I was um, trying to explain earlier, um, which is that internal audit is responsible to those charged with governance, to management and to the board for providing assurance internally about controls. External audit is responsible for providing assurance to me as the Auditor General and onto you as the committee about um, the financial statements and the wider governance. So they, they do have different roles. And it may be that in this case, internal audit has failed. Um, but I, I don't think we can draw that conclusion from the work that we've done so far. What's clear to me is that the system by which the college understood its likely income and expenditure didn't pick up this change early enough and led to a funding gap at the end of the year. But you, you say that uh, you yourself and you appoint auditors mm -hmm. uh, have them do an ongoing audit process. Um, is it common among the colleges that is just a snapshot at the end of the year? No, um, Hugh can tell you how he goes about the audit of um, Edinburgh College. I appoint Hugh as the external auditor and he will take the approach that I described. Hugh, do you want to give a bit more detail on that? Yeah, in, in terms of our uh, communications and interactions with the college throughout the year, they are on a, on a quarterly basis. Um, and it, it generally uh, means us looking at the internal management accounts that are prepared and uh, preparing questions to then speak to management about. Um, but I guess to answer the, the question around the, these, fu the, these funding uh, issues, to, to get into the level of detail that would allow us to do that would take you know, a week or two weeks, and, and we, don't, we don't have that much time during the year to do that. However, um, that, that's our role as external auditors, the internal auditors, just to expand on, on what the Auditor General had said, they, they will do what they are directed to do by those charged with governance. So should um, management decide that they want a closer look at the level of funding throughout the year, they will direct the internal auditors to do that. Um, you know, it's, it's not within the internal auditors' remit to always look at those particular areas. They will, they will do as they are asked, effectively. So you do a quarterly update with the college and you ask questions of any issues and so on that uh, might arise or according to a fixed programme that you've got. Yes. Would you not be asking for changes, about any changes that would impact on their funding? We would ask about how funding uh, was uh, going during the year. Were there any issues with um, student numbers, student recruitment? Um, that, uh, that are driving the underlying numbers, we, not ne we wouldn't necessarily get into that level of detail, no. And you would, it, would it be the internal auditors that, in Edinburgh College that you would expect to supply you with the information? If they were directed in that way, then we would look to them um, and work with them um, so that we could uh, leverage the work that they had done um, however, when it comes to our work that we carry out following the year end, um, because as the Auditor General has pointed out, my, my role is to report on the, uh, the robustness of the, the information supporting uh, the, the numbers in the year end accounts. Uh, that is when this issue arose. We became aware of it. And so our role was to ensure that that issue was appropriately reflected in the accounts. So uh, internal audits did not pick it up at all. You picked it up as the external auditor when you mm. saw the year end. No, no, we, we were told of it when we were carrying out our work at the year end. And so our role is then to ensure that that information that we were told was appropriately reflected in the accounts, which it was. And that was the first indication that you'd had? That we had had, yes. OK. Can I just ask, who told you? Uh, we were told by the Director of Finance. Not by internal audit? Not by internal audit, no. And whose responsibility was it in the first place to follow the guidance from the SFC? Was that Director of Finance? But the, yes, the, the Director of Finance, the, uh, the management team effectively within the organisation. So the Director of Finance should have read the guidance and followed the guidance the Director of Finance uh, would yeah, be responsible for understanding what the guidance was. Um, it would be those within the curriculum um, who are recording the students um, and the activity against those students 
um, who then provide the information which allows the claim to be pulled no, together. I understand that, but yeah. here, here is guidance to, to paraphrase from the SFC, the issue and instruction from now on, you cannot apply additionality, paraphrasing, okay? Mm -hmm. I take it the financial controller or director of finance in the college then, what you're saying is, is responsible for making sure that from that day forward, no assumption is made about getting additionality income in and you don't invoice the SFC for additionality because it's no longer claimable. Is that right? That would be my view, yes. So has the director of finance been disciplined? No. £800,000 of public money down the Swanee and nobody's been disciplined? Why no has one. nobody been disciplined? I think that's a question for the college rather than for us. Um, but you do not be commenting on it as the auditor. As I've said in my report, the um, principal has carried out a very wide-ranging review um, to look at what happened here and the um, impact on the financial position of the college in future and put in place a transformation plan for it. I can't comment on the individual responsibilities for it. My responsibility is to highlight to this committee um, what the impact is of the uh, failure that took place in this case mm. um, and the wider lessons that might come from it. But I think there's a pattern. It's like last week, you know, large amounts of public money are getting wasted as a result of incompetence, and yet nobody seems to take responsibility. Nobody gets disciplined. I mean, if that was in the private sector, he'd be sacked for losing £800,000 if it was his responsibility or her, whoever he is or she is, their responsibility. £800,000 of public money is down the swanee because somebody didn't do their job properly. Not good enough. Oh, if I may, if I may, sorry. Yep. Uh, the investigation in relation to this, is, as Mark had mentioned, is still ongoing. Um, I think it's unfair to point the finger at the Director of Finance because nobody knows who, if there is indeed one person, uh, was to blame in relation to this. Well, it's, not, it's about responsibility. I mean, I yeah. asked you the question, mm -hmm. you're the auditor, so mm -hmm. I'm taking it from you. You said he was responsible. You know, he is the person who has to implement the policy, as you would expect. In any corporate body, the finance director has to implement new guidance on what's claimable and not claimable. Um, so I'm not saying maybe he had somebody he employed who was supposed to check these things because obviously it's a big college, you can't individually mm -hmm. check everything. What I'm saying is, yet again, a lot of public money down the Swanee and nobody, uh, it would appear, has been taking responsibility for that. And we've got, you know, we've got a finance director and a finance department, we've got internal auditors, we've got external auditors, and between all of you, it wasn't picked up to the tail end of the financial year, as a result of which... Yeah, hundred thousand pounds was lost. Can I just add to that very briefly, convener? I'm not here to um, apologise for the college or the funding council, um, but I think this case is a bit different from the others that I've reported to the committee on in the past, um, where, for example, voluntary severance has resulted in payments that were higher than justified to individuals and money was lost to the public purse. In this case, the, the situation is that funding hasn't been claimed from the funding council, wasn't available from the funding council for activity that had been delivered, learning activity. Um, so the money wasn't lost to the public purse. What we have is a funding gap for the Edinburgh College. I recognise that's a fine distinction, but I think it's important for the record to, to be clear about fair it. Fair enough, but uh, you know, clearly, eight hundred thousand is not an insignificant amount of money. I wouldn't wouldn't disagree with you and, at all. And you know, if you look look at the total fees for the internal auditor, the external auditor, and the finance department, you know, you would expect for that amount, presumably a fairly substantial amount of money, you would expect between them to get this sorted, to have got this sorted. And I, I think external audit has done its job in this case. Um, the, the management that is charged with governance of the college are responsible for having systems in place that prevent this sort of thing from happening. And clearly those systems failed in this instance. Absolutely. That's why I've reported to you. Yeah. We can maybe take that up with um, Alison Harris. No, I'm fine. You're fine. OK. Can I ask finally on the Edinburgh report, are you satisfied with the Scottish Funding Council's response and Edinburgh College's response? I think um, it's early to, to say that. Um, we've said they have a transformation plan in place. There is a funding agreement to cover the college's funding gap through to 2018-19. In a sense, the proof will be in the pudding and the progress they make with that transformation plan. Um, and I'll be in a better position at the end of the next, the 2015-16 audit, when I'll report back to this committee on what the current position looks like. 
Okay. I'm now going to move to the Glasgow report. Uh, can I invite questions on the Glasgow report? Does anyone? Colin. I suppose the Glasgow report in some ways is a story, because, uh, but I would just like a, a reassurance that uh, all the issues that uh, came out in this have been fully dealt with and that Audit Scotland is now satisfied that uh, Glasgow College is uh, where it should be. I'll ask Gary to pick that one up, if I may, Mr Beattie. Um, so all of the issues have not been fully dealt with, but the majority of them have been dealt with. So. For example, uh, all of the issues you have in paragraph two of the section 22 report around risk management frameworks, uh, internal audit function, key committees operating effectively, uh, an approved scheme of financial delegation and so on, those are all in place. But the financial memorandum, the draft one between Glasgow College's regional board and the assigned colleges has yet to be finalised. And also the Scottish Funding Council probably quite reasonably want to observe how GCRB and the assigned colleges are working together over a reasonable time to see how that relationship is developing before they release funds. But most, if not most of the building blocks that we asked for in the Section 22 report are now in place, just about to be finalised, and they're at the final stages of, those, um, of that process. So would it be correct to say that uh, there's certainly no public funds at risk at this point? There's sufficient governance, there's sufficient internal audit and processes to be assured of that? Um, in the main, yes, although the final judgment of that is, is resting largely with the Scottish Funding Council around the, the point at which they are assured that they are able to grant operational fundable body status to GCRB. So from where we sit, uh, great progress has been made over the last 12 months in putting those building blocks in place, and those are now working. Some of them are more recently in place than others, so there's just a little bit of time just to make sure that those processes are now operating effectively now that they are in place. Is it because there's still some concerns that the, the uh, date given in paragraph 22 of 1st August 2016 for granting operational fundable body status has been pushed back into January? Um, I think that's really a matter for the Funding Council around how they explain um, how they have gotten to that position. I do know that from GCRB, which mm. is the body that I'm the external auditor for, um, they have been working really hard with the Funding Council in partnership, and those relationships are much improved. And they've been working together on that programme to make sure those building blocks of governance are now fully in place. And as I say, as I said in my previous answer, they're largely in place now. I mean, there, there was a date given here. I'd be interested to know why it's not been adhered to. What's caused the slippage again? Because this report was done when uh, March, and at that time, August, was the date in which it was going to be implemented. This is only our understanding that, as Gary said, the um, Funding Council would like to see how the relationships between the regional body and the three colleges play out in practice, given the history of this. Um, and they expect it to be fully in place by January. As, as, as of today, that's our understanding of the position. Okay. Great. Okay. Right. Oh, General, did you want to make any remarks on this report? I'm separately? happy to go ahead with questions. Thank okay. you, Convener. Any further questions? Okay. Can I thank you very much indeed for your evidence this morning. Um, I am now going to suspend for a comfort break. Thank you.